Thank you so much, Gabe and Larry, for inviting me back again. And some of you I know were here last year. I think you were, were you? You looked the other. Well, okay. Uh, so I don't want to repeat everything that I said last year. Uh, it's really great to have Chris Howell here. And I've known Chris, oh my goodness, maybe 20 years. Uh, because I've been in my job, not 24, but I'm starting my 24th year. Oh. And so uh, it's Chris and I have similar positions. And are you a political appointee? Uh, no. Okay. I am uh, not appointed by the governor. I work as um, <clears throat> work for 14 Indian commissioners appointed by the governor. And when I started in my position back in 1995, I was working for a Democratic governor, Governor Ben Nelson, who then went on to be a United States senator. And um, then after uh, Governor Nelson, it was Governor Mike Johans, who became a uh, United States senator and the Secretary of Ag. And then after him, Governor Heinemann, and now Governor Pete Ricketts. And the last three were all Republicans. I myself am a registered Democrat, but I have to kind of act like an independent. So uh, I have to work on both sides. So thank goodness uh, I'm not an appointee because I would have been out of a job <laughs> shortly after I started my job. But I know you guys are all really anxious to get out of here and I don't want to take too long. So Gabe, when it gets to uh, like five minutes, give me the signal because I want to show you a couple little clips uh, about the standing bear and that's going to be there's a light that's blinking. Wow, that light is bright. Isn't that light bright? I'm going to move over here. It's coming off of that. Wow, it's right in my eyes. I'm so sorry. Okay, so um, just to tell you a little bit about my journey, and I, a lot that I do in my life seems to be um, connected to my tribal people. And uh, Chief Standing Bear is one of the great leaders of the Ponca tribe, and I'm at Roll Ponca, and I'm Santee Sioux. So I kind of uh, talk about my life as a journey, like Sandy Bear made a journey. And um, you are all on journeys. So going backwards to my family, um, I do not descend from Sandy Bear. I descend from Smokemaker, Chief Smokemaker. And my uh, Santee grandmother was born in 1890. Mm -hmm. And she went to the Santee Normal school on the Santee Reservation. My mother went to the Genoa Indian School in Genoa, Nebraska, one of those uh, Pratt Institute schools, much like Haskell was in Chilaco and other places around the country. And the motto at that school was to kill the Indian, save the man, or kill the Indian, save the child. My mother went back home to the reservation. She had eight siblings, two went with her to the school, two of her sisters. She became a tribal councilwoman when white women weren't doing such things. And then uh, my grandfather, my Ponca grandfather, he was the last chief of the second rank of the Ponca tribe. And he was born in 1878. The trial of Sandy Bear was in 1879, and my grandfather did not go with his mother down on the trail. They were hid out by some of the Sioux people up around the reservation along the Niobrara. So Sandy Bear's trial was in 1879 in Omaha, and then he eventually returned. And my grandfather and his brother and my grandmother had allotments per the allotment era in the Dawes Act, and they were right up the river from Sandy Bear. So I have this little map in my dining room, and uh, down at the bottom of the river is Sandy Bear's allotment, and then my grandfather and his brother and my grandmother. And her name uh, was Miga So, um, my grandfather was 30 when Standing Bear died in 1908, to sort of put this into context from a time frame. So my um, mother and my grandmother moved to Norfolk, Nebraska, and uh, they decided the, the reservation was extreme poverty. There were a lot of tragedies um, that I'm sure many of you can relate to, a lot of um, alcohol abuse and violence, etc. So. At the boarding school, my mother learned how to be a cook, and she made fabulous bakery, pastries, etc. And so my grandmother and her, with my eldest three siblings, uh, ventured to Norfolk, and that's where I was born, first generation off reservation. And there uh, was no one in Norfolk that would rent to Indian people except a black 
a man named Henry Jones, and he was like a slum landlord. So he had a salvage junkyard, which is a very uh, lucrative business <laughs> to be in. And he had shacks, these little shacks. And so until I was 10 years old, I lived in a three-room house with my um, 10 brothers and sisters. And there were 13 of us. My uh, Santee grandmother, she was a little tiny lady who I loved dearly. She lived to be 86 years old. And she and I and my little sister slept in a twin rollaway bed in the kitchen. And every day we would get up and put the roll away bed away and I would go to school. I didn't know that I was poor and I lived in a junkyard. So I always tell people, I'm a junkyard dog and I'm not a res girl, but I'm a pretty tough girl <laughs> because I grew up in a junkyard. So uh, uh, the, our landlord, our black landlord and his um, sons were kind of brutal and would throw rocks at us. It was a very dangerous place to live. There were shootings and some people were murdered in my neighborhood. So I, I grew up with a lot of violence in our neighborhood. So moving forward then, uh, just to kind of tell you where I came from, I was uh, the first and only of my 10 siblings to go to college. And in high school, I was in debate and uh, forensics. And I think that was somewhat of a uh, innate gift that came to me from my family as tribal leaders. Uh, my mother was very shy. She didn't talk a lot about what went on at the boarding school, but my Santee grandmother, she was just pretty amazing. And she stayed home and took care of us while my, when we were children. And my mother worked um, at a cafe until a week before she died. And when I went to college, uh, my mother died when I was first started college. I was 19. And she uh, worked until a week before she died, baking cinnamon rolls in this little cafe in Norfolk, Nebraska. So that was kind of a hard thing, but I stayed in college and uh, I got my associate's degree and then I um, uh, didn't continue on. I got married and had two children and then I, um, as life goes, uh, that didn't work out and I realized that to uh, take care of my two daughters, I was going to have to uh, find a way to provide for us. So I started going back to college before I got divorced in Ohio where I lived. And uh, that was so empowering for me. And I was really lucky. Uh, you talked about working in a store. When I lived in Norfolk, I worked in a clothing store. And uh, it was a men's clothing store, Richard's Men Clothing Store. And it was a Jewish man uh, that owned it, Richard Sleeber. And uh, I would have to put shirts on uh, mannequins, and he taught me how to do that flawlessly with 100 pins. And if I didn't get it right, he would make, take out all the pins. So uh, that is really good training, because in life, wherever you go, you're going to have a boss, and you have to work with people. And what he taught me was the customer is always right. And so even in my work today, I always try to treat people like I'd like to be treated and always try to look for solutions and be part of the solution and not the problem. So I, I had that retail background and that really did help me a lot in life. But uh, So I went back to college and then I uh, moved back to Nebraska where I was from and our tribe was terminated in 1964 and we were restored without a land base and we, um, or we started in 1990. So I started going to college at Doan University here in the Lincoln campus, which was kind of a new thing for Doan to have uh, adult classes for non-traditional students. And um, I worked for the tribe, the Ponca tribe. And first I started out as a secretary and I opened up the little office over on Pioneer Boulevard. And then a position came available. At the same time as our tribe was restored, the federal law, Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, November 6, kicked in. Uh, we were restored on Halloween in 1990. So um, the tribe, uh, I applied and I got the job as the NAGPRA representative. Now, I was going to college. I only had an associate's degree. I was not trained, like you said. Um, it was a learning curve, but I took a lot of training from other people that had experience in the repatriation field. I went to conferences, etc. So uh, from there, I continued to go to college with my two daughters. Uh, some days I would drive in the morning. I would go to Niobrara four hours away and work and turn around and drive back eight hours of driving and then go to class from six to 10 at night with two little girls at home. But that's what I had to do. 
to uh, have my job and to go to college. It wasn't easy. And I always say in life, uh, it doesn't fall out of the sky. Every day you have to get up and work and do it. And my mother did it and she was such a good role model. And I saw what she did so that we could have uh, a better life. And so I was really blessed to have people that had a strong work ethic. So eventually, um, I uh, opportunity came for the opening at the Indian Commission. And when I applied for that position, I did not have a bachelor's degree. But somehow, I was hired. And I was close to getting my bachelor's degree. Today, that probably wouldn't happen. But then, it was a different world, before the internet. <laughs> and so I got my job. And I could have stopped after my bachelor's degree. But I really felt to be a policymaker and to feel equal. Uh, most of the times, I would go into rooms with men, the governor and all these uh, senators, and I was a woman. And it was kind of intimidating as a Native woman uh, with people that didn't know anything about Indian, Indian people. So I felt it was really important that I continue my education. And so I went on um, and got my master's degree from Doan University here at the Lincoln campus. And um, so Doan, uh, I've got a story thread here that I'm going to introduce you to. Sometimes in life, like Gabe said, he met me. And he didn't quite tell you all the details. And I'm going to add a little bit of those details. <laughs> I recruited Gabe to work at a camp, one of our camps. He was a counselor. And then I said, Gabe, uh, you got to meet, uh, talk to Larry over here, Dr. Roulette. And so Gabe was a philosophy student, and he, Larry was so impressed, and Gabe became a part of that program and uh, continued on and now is the director of the camp and got his PhD. So that was pretty amazing. So, okay, so I'm still at the Indian Commission. I have my master's degree, and uh, let's see, seven years ago, I was appointed to the Bo Doan Board of Trustees as the first Native person, the college that I went to. So the majority of the trustees are elderly white males. There's some women, but I'm the only Native person. A couple African Americans, no Hispanics. I became friends with this gentleman. His name was Don Miller Campbell. And he uh, grew up here in Nebraska. He went to Doan for a couple years, and then he got his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Nebraska. His family owned a clothing store that you kids are all too young to ever remember, but Miller and Payne Clothing Store is a retail store. And uh, you can still buy the cinnamon rolls. Expenses. So the family was a very successful family. He then went to Stanford, got his MBA, and became a millionaire. But he didn't know anything about Indians until he met me. So I was um, an adjunct professor at the University of Nebraska as well as a director of the Indian Commission. And I taught a class called Native Daughters. So I would give him these magazines and tell him all about what, what I did. And he was really moved by what I did. And so sometimes in life, you're at the right place at the right time. And it's because you get up and you go to work and you do the hard work day in and day out. But all of you, I commend all of you for being here because you took a risk and you did something out of your comfort zone. You are here and it's more than half the battle in life is being present being engaged, because then that's when you have opportunities. So I was about uh, four or five years ago that I got this email from my friend Don Miller Campbell. He was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he was seeing all these beautiful bronze sculptures. And he sent me this email at Thanksgiving. I remember just vividly where I was when I opened up my phone and saw this. And he said, Judy, what would you think about me donating money to have a bronze sculpture of Ponca Chief Standing Bear in Nebraska? That was quite a Thanksgiving gift. And I said, yes, uh, that would be lovely. <laughs> so we did. We did that. And that was in 2017. And then the Ponca tribe at the time we negotiated that, the tribe uh, asked if they could have to be supportive, if they could have a bronze as well up at the Niobrara. So they got theirs for $50,000 less than the one here. And that was dedicated in 2018. So um, moving along then, one day um, as life goes, uh, the legislature was in session and I was sitting down reading the newspaper and my staff was out of the office and I saw an article that Senator Burt Carr had introduced a bill to change out one of our bronze sculptures in Statuary Hall, the Morton statue, to uh, Willa Cather. 
and our state had just had their 150th celebration, and the top two most famous people were Willa Cather and Standing Bear. So I said, oh my goodness, I was thinking about doing this, but I wasn't quite ready because we were still celebrating the uh, Standing Bear in 2017. So that kind of pushed the envelope and I hurriedly had to think. And so I put my critical thinking skills to work that I learned at Doan University and all those relationships that I built. And I emailed uh, my donor and the artist, Ben Victor, who was the youngest person to ever have a sculpture a piece in Statuary Hall. And now he is the first person to have three in Statuary Hall. He had the Sarah Winnemucca from Nevada, and he had the Warlock from Iowa, and then Standing Bear. So I emailed him and I said, Ben Victor, how much would it cost for us to have Standing Bear at a Statuary Hall? He quickly came up with the figures for the whole total cost. It was 150000 My donor, I uh, called him up or emailed him, and I said, Don, here's the deal. <laughs> if we don't have the money, it'll be a barrier and it won't pass, and um, it's a fiscal barrier. So will you fund Standing Bear going to Statuary Hall? And he said, count me in. So I immediately then went downstairs to Senator Brewer, Tom Brewer. Some, I don't think any of you have met him, but he's the first Native American state senator from the Oglala Sioux Nation, who had been on my board as a vice chair. And by the way, Gabe is on my board as well. So I had a relationship. Again, life is about building relationships. The friendships you make here and the professionals you meet could have a huge impact on your life going forward. So Senator Brewer said, well, we'll have to talk to Senator Burke Carr. Well, Burke Carr was a Democrat. We are a unicameral with 49 senators, the majority Republican. Our governor was a Republican. So Burke needed Senator Brewer, who is a Native American Republican, and the majority vote. So because of that, Willa Cather and Standing Bear were voted per LB 807 to go to Statuary Hall. And uh, Standing Bear was dedicated in September, September 18th, in Statuary Hall. And I was so blessed and fortunate to be able to work with my daughter. As I told you, I had two daughters. They both graduated from the University of Nebraska. My youngest daughter is a teacher and she has three children. My eldest daughter graduated uh, from the University in Sociology and then she went to Columbia Law School. And she is an attorney at an international law firm in Washington, D.C., Aiken Gump, and she does Indian policy law. And water law is her specialty. So her law firm was so moved by her appeal to let her do this pro bono work that her boss, uh, Don Pongre, said, okay, you've convinced me. You can work on the project. So uh, she had worked on the trail project for us. We're trying to get a federal trail established as well. So um, through all of her efforts working with the AOC of the U.S. Capitol, I mean, it was beyond her 60 hours of pro bono work that she does a year we were able to do that. And so it was just really rewarding for me to think back to my family and my mother uh, and growing up in a junkyard, that here we are in Washington, D.C. at the dedication with Speaker Pelosi, you know, being the, and Chris Howell was at that event, so he can attest to, it was quite amazing, standing room only. Uh, one of the counsel from the Omaha tribe was there. It was just really, really one of the, high points in my life that I'll always remember. And uh, for all of us here, it's something because of that trial, we were humans, didn't become citizens until 1924. When my mother was born, she wasn't a citizen of the United States of America. But nonetheless, uh, that's kind of some of the great work that I've been able to do. And But I always remind people, we're gonna see a video here in a minute about that, that even though this happened, there's still more work to do. You can't just have bricks and mortar and a bronze sculpture without thinking about all of us here today. And so the legacy of Standing Bear needs to be a living legacy that I am committed to. And LB 154 was a bill that we had passed this last year. When we closed White Clay down through a previous bill, I lobbied the two senators, Senator Brewer and Senator Patty Pansy Brooks, to introduce a bill, LB 154, for the protection of missing and murdered indigenous women. So I'm tasked with working with the state patrol this year uh, to give the report to the legislature. And those are the kind of actions that will make Standing Bear's journey meaningful because even though we weren't humans till then, we still have been treated inhumanely today. Uh, the Indian mascot, I tried to 
well, we're still in consideration about getting rid of the mascots in Nebraska, but that's something that isn't going so well. <laughs> so that's another battle that we have. So the work goes on, and um, I know you guys need to get going. So what I wanted to close up with was two snippets of the actual ceremony. And you can see the first one is by Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, who's been really supportive. He introduced the bill for the trail, uh, which has passed three times on the House side. And I was uh, very fortunate to testify last spring uh, before the um, Natural Resources Committee with Senate, uh, Congresswoman Deb Holland oversees that committee. And she's one of the first two Native Congresswomen who ha attended our dedication and our receptions as well. So it's really an honor for me as an Indian woman to get to testify before her. And she's a very lovely person who is doing a lot of great things, as is Sheree Davids from Kansas. So we're very proud. And we really feel like, as First Peoples, uh, we're invisible no more you know all my life i had to be invisible as a child i had to bleach out so that in the summer when i went back to school i wouldn't be called the n-word and today um, i'm so proud of all of you that are here and that we're still here so many people only learned about native people from 1900 forwards and they quit learning about them in eighth grade that's what we've been finding through the illuminative research and so we're working on that as well so in closing uh, I do hope that you all will consider staying on your journey of education because without education my life would not have been as fulfilling and I wouldn't have been able to help my own family and um, I like to think that I've helped other people and done a lot of mentoring and I'm not finished yet and I'm so blessed to have worked with Phyllis and her daughter and there's so many wonderful Native people that really given an opportunity we can overcome some of these barriers and I do believe that education is the way to level the playing field and empowers you and being educated doesn't mean not being Native as some people sometimes associate that with, that we're being white. No, we can be as intelligent um, as Charles Eastman or any of the other people that uh, have done great things in our world. So I hope you enjoy these two little snippets. The other is Senator Deb Fisher. Uh, she has a little bit to say, and I wish you a good uh, time while you're here and safe travels home. Bibla ho. D.C., honoring notable people in their state's history. For the past 82 years, William Jennings Bryan has stood in Statuary Hall, welcoming Nebraskans and visitors to the United States Capitol as a symbol of the good life. This week, we welcome a new statue to represent our state, Chief Standing Bear. Chief Standing Bear was the leader of Nebraska's Ponca tribe. Under the threat of bayonets, his tribe was forced to leave their land and travel 600 miles to the Indian Territory of Oklahoma. Over one third of the tribe died due to poor living conditions on the Indian reservation, including his son. Chief Standing Bear promised his son he would bury him in their tribe's homeland in Nebraska. But on his way to fulfill that promise, he was put on trial for leaving the Indian Reservation. During his trial, Chief Standing Bear 
gave one of the greatest speeches in American history. He said, this hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you also feel pain. The blood that will flow from mine will be of the same color as yours. I am a man. Chief Standing Bear echoed those same principles our founders ingrained in our blueprint for freedom. The judge ruled in Chief Standing Bear's favor, creating a landmark decision that extended equal justice under law to Native Americans. I am proud that Nebraska put forward Chief Standing Bear to be one of our United States Capitol statues, for he is a Nebraska treasure and an American hero. He will be honored for years to come for his moving and true words. I am a man that helped our country recognize the dignity and honor of all people.